welcome to the ghost show online by fiends, booze, and ghouls. <laughs> Your hosts, Seeker Groves, Rachel Benjamin, and Ian Russell will discuss all things paranormal. Prepare to be afraid. 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 We're going to chat about the origins of Halloween and, you know, sort of, I think we can talk about the history of it, but also, too, you know, sort of what does Halloween mean to, you know, Rachel or Ian or myself? Um, yep. You know, do we, you know, we, we all kind of have our own take on it and uh, we also have our own, you know, spooky, creepy factor as to Halloween. And like I said, for me, work-wise, this is always the most busy season for me. Right. So let's look at really historically then, who would have cool. celebrated this and, and why? Why do they celebrate this, right? I mean, we we kind mm-hmm. of know the word Samhain, right, or Samhain and Samhain. Um, but what does it mean and where did it sort of get its you know, its origins. I mean, I, I know that everybody goes back to Ireland with this and and um, Scotland and Manx and sort of, you know, that general area. Uh, but for most part, it really was observed by the Celts in general, right? So no matter where the Celts were at the time, they may yeah. have been Galatians, um, etc. It's taken on this kind of new old world thing with neo-pagans and Wiccans and things like that too, right? Going back. But in truth, it's really a kind of mid-season harvest or end of harvest season, right? That kind of falls. um, Yeah. Yeah. The old, uh, the old traditions um, of, of, you know, what we call Halloween. Right. It marked the end of the, the harvesting season and the beginning of winter. Yeah, and because we're moving into that darker half of the year. So traditionally, you know, this was a time to eat and have a feast and enjoy and light a fire and celebrate sort of the the bounty of the harvest, but also to, you know, create food storage and all of these things moving into, you know, the cold winter months or the the harshest times of year. So looking at, again, this time of year, generally celebrated between October 31st and November 1st on on what we now know as the Gregorian calendar, right? In the ancient times, going back to the Iron Age and the Bronze Age, they were actually celebrating as well. Um, just in a different way, but but at that time, of course, they didn't really look at the date per se, right? It wasn't like, oh, today's October thirty first. We have to, <laughs> right? It was it was based on their their changing of the season, their harvest, their time of the year, which generally falls around this time, right? <laughs> but it carried over for more than a day. So here we just it's like Halloween, we yay, it's done. It's October thirty first, and it's over. But in um, historically, it was over several days, right? And then Christianity oh, came into it. it, and it became something slightly different. And that and that was something off the top of the show that I had mentioned, is that some people believe that Halloween itself is more of a Christian belief as opposed to Samhain oh, and how was that was celebrated. Right. So, well, you, you will. We will discuss this, and you will understand perhaps how some people believe this to be what it is, and I and I can completely understand it. Right. So, oh, in um, in certain cultures, I know that um, as you say, it, it's more than just October thirty first that it mm-hmm. extends into November first. And right. even um, specifically the um, what I believe is the Mexican culture mm-hmm. on November second is what they call the Day of the Dead, and they kind right. of incorporate that entire Halloween All Saints Day 
um, stuff into, all merged yeah. together. It, right. And you have to remember, too, with them that originally in their cultures, their Aztec, the Mayan, um, those people, that they had their own holidays or their own celebrations around, again, that shift in in the season. Because they're on a latitude, they're essentially just above the equator. So the seasons did have a slight, you know, of course, it's not like here where we're, you know, going from spring to, to summer to winter. But there were still changes in, in the seasons to a degree and what food sources were available and, you know, the way the weather patterns changed, etc. So um, their celebration really brings in some of their old, the, the old Aztec, the old Mayan, but also, of course, because of the Spanish, a lot of Catholicism, right? So, so that's where a lot of that comes from. Um, now, interestingly enough, um, just looking at, at some of the information that I was going through uh, earlier, um, again, it kind of goes back to the Celts, right? But there's sort of right. a, a, a real mishmash there because, again, we we have to look at what was pre-Christian influence, and it's really difficult to do that through written manuscripts because Ireland, <laughs> Scotland, and even England at that time, um, Britain, there wasn't any real written language. So we don't really know what it, how they they celebrated per se. Um, what we do know is by looking historically at um, sites, right? So we're looking at yeah. perhaps celebration sites or specific um, spiritual locations and that. And we look at a number of different things um, in, you know, the way buildings were erected. And, and was it this week? Yeah, just this week, I believe it was. Actually, no, it was last um, last week. I was lucky enough to be invited to watch and listen to an archaeologist out of Scotland, Glasgow, um, who was speaking on uh, wheel uh, wheelhouses. And these wheelhouses really have a life of their own only in the Outer Hebrides and the Shetland Islands. So they don't exist anywhere else, and they're they're they possibly go back to Neolithic to bronze. They're most definitely Iron Age, and a lot of them were used right up until the Victorian era. Predominantly, they were dwellings. Um, and if you're at all familiar with the Outer Hebrides, or if you're not, it's a very kind of rocky terrain. Once upon a time, there were some trees. But those trees were all cut down for the most part for building places to to live. So, and it's kind of a strange um, landscape there because they have um, the shorelines, of course, because they are islands. But on the eastern side of the island is where the most fertile land is or sorry, on the west side of the island, and on the east side is more rocky. So it's a very, you know, there's there's not a lot of growing there. There's not a lot of agricultural. There's a lot of peat um, harvesting there and things like that. So, but, so these houses were built mostly from rocks, and they were round structures, which is why they're called wheelhouses, but it, it's how they were built. Inside, they have piers. So they have these sectioned piers that go around, and these piers don't connect to the outside wall, which is, you know, we're still trying to figure that out as archaeologists and, and people studying this. Right. Um, but they were used to hold up the wooden beams for the circular round roofs. So they're really quite a very unique style. Look them up online. There, Like I said, there's really no other buildings like this anywhere. Um, there's roundhouses in the UK. You know, you hear about Roman roundhouses and things like that, but not built in this pattern. They're very unique. But interestingly enough, some of those, we were talking about some of those um, locations and some of the things there, 
and this sort of came into play, was the directions of the doors. The doorways are all facing east for the most part. There's, I believe, two wheelhouses where the doors did not face east. And so this is going back to the Iron Age uh, culture. And so they were, you know, why were they, were they having their doors facing east, right? So there's, there's a number of things, much like Stonehenge and many other, you know, you've got that east-west alignment. Um, the sun comes up, it shines the light, and there's no windows in these wheelhouses. So the only light you would have received would have been from the sun entering through that door. But also, too, oh, there's the oh. Eastern Passage and a lot of things with death that are associated with the facings of the directions. So this got us chatting a little bit about, um, you know, the the celebrations of Samhain and um, also uh, Beltane and a number of other celebrations that went on in these vicinities and how even building their homes were greatly influenced by, um, you know, the passage of, of light and death and all of these different things. So really interesting. And and much the same with, with Sao and this celebration um, we look at. Now, it's changed a little bit, right? Because back then, it was a Celtic festival um, that was really just around the fall harvest, there's nothing to indicate that they were celebrating any dead or anything right. like that, right? So um, the connotations of that came later on with Christianity. Now we have the tradition of carving a pumpkin, right? It was turnips back then, right? So there's no pumpkin carving. Yeah, they were turnips, right? So if you know what a turnip's oh, like, you can imagine... <laughs> how hard it is to carve a turnip. <laughs> All right? So could you imagine trying to carve a turnip? Yeah. <clears throat> no, I think but, I'll pass on that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, they're they're pretty they're pretty woody at the best of times and pretty tough, but but that was, you know, that was a common root vegetable then. Pumpkins are something that came from the West, right? They were they were part of the squash family that indigenous people were were growing that were not in Europe. Europe didn't have them. Nowhere had them until, you know, until we had that exchange of um, European invaders and taking back things like tomatoes and squash and potatoes and all of these things to the old world, as they like to call it, from the new world. But um, I find it interesting that turnips were sort of lit in the term. They were carved out. They, yeah, oh, I know there's a yeah, and there's also too sort of a you know we're we're trying to figure out um, some I guess some old small fragments of these things have been found, but there's nothing to say that they were carving faces in them, right? So again, that comes later on. But they were lighting turnips and they were putting, you know, a, a source of fire inside the turnip and placing them outside the door. And at the time, um, it really, what that was, was an invitation for the living to visit and to share food with each other. So it didn't really have anything to do again with death. Oh. It was about eating and, and sharing and preparing for the the winter and coming so coming back to the celebration of the harvest that's right coming back to that celebration of the harvest so right. um you know historically it, it really is um it's it's taken on new you know a new life in in a sense right that um you know, this was a time of the year when the cattle were brought back from the summer pastures. They usually sent the cattle, um, cattle and sheep uh, would go to the highlands over the summer and they would graze there and they would, you know, and then come this time of year, they would bring the cattle back to the lowlands because it was less harsh and also because you needed to slaughter them for food. 
So it mm-hmm. was that time where you spent, you know, they spent the summer eating and fattening up and, and you know, for the purpose of us to um, to consume. So it really is around food and the celebration of food. And until we get that Christianity creeping in, there's nothing to really show us that it was anything outside of that, weirdly enough. I hate to say it, all you neo-pagans and Wiccans who believe that it was all about <laughs> conjuring up the dead. Um, there's yeah, nothing to, nothing, nothing <laughs> well, to think, prove uh, that Yeah, at this point, right? But it doesn't mean it didn't happen. It just means that we can't find any viable proof to show that these you know, these things happened. Um, there's, you know, stories, word of mouth, but it's been a thousands of years. What are your sort of recollections of Halloween over the course of your life? Like, have they changed? Is it, um, you know, is it different now than when you were a kid? Or, you know, sort of what stands out for you? So when I was younger, I absolutely loved Halloween. Uh, back in England, it, it's very similar to the way you guys celebrate it. Um, over here, well, not you guys, because you're Canadian, but the Americans, the way the Americans celebrate it, you know, with all the decorations and um, all the Halloween costumes, and um, we used to buy these plastic masks (laughs) that you could get, that just had like a picture of a witch on it, or something like that, Uh, my mom, my mom once got me a just unfortunately, we didn't have a lot of money for very extravagant costumes. So it was just a pretty much a make it yourself, wear it, and, and then go trick or treating, um, which was always very fun for me. And I was always very excited to go and do it. Um, you know, with all the other kids, my 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 parents at one point lived in a sort of suburban suburban street. Um, so it was very much that sort of running from house to house with your little basket and 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 so forth and getting your candy from your neighbors that you, know, you tend to know um i and i've but i as i grew older i think i i think personally i've always been fascinated by halloween um i think the older i've gotten the more i have a healthy respect for it you know it's no longer a uh, a fun holiday where you just go running around in a costume. Um, but it definitely is more than that to me. Um, I think more so on a spiritual level. Um, if it, uh, the whole uh, commentary about the veil sort of being a lot thinner during Halloween sort of uh, resonates with me personally. I don't know if it does with you, Seeker, but... Um, yeah, no, it it certainly there's some certainly some things there for me that um you know do do play into it. Um yeah, you know, I, I Ian, what's what do you what do you feel about Halloween? Well, for me, yeah, it was um uh, uh yeah, when uh, when I was a child, um of course it was Going out, trick or treating, um, dressing up in a costume, even something as simple as having a a white sheet draped over right. myself with with <laughs> eye holes, going as a ghost. Um, it was always homemade, wasn't it? I don't yeah. know if it was for you, Ian, but it definitely yeah. was for me. We got we got the black uh, uh, garbage bags, you know. Would you? Yeah, know? exactly, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> and um, I I remember. Um, Halloween as a child, um, we always had a dinner, driving in to say something as our Canadian Thanksgiving, but there was always a special dinner for Halloween that we'd have maybe a little bit of turkey or something. Um, oh, indeed. Yeah, nothing on the scale of how of um, Thanksgiving, and okay. you know pumpkin pie and and everything that you associate with with um, dining in in Halloween time. Yeah. And mm-hmm. then my my dad would take me out trick or treating, and uh, oh, well, my right. dad has passed, you know, years ago now. He died when I was young, oh. and so for me, it was then uh, once I had children, it was able to take my daughter out for trick mm-hmm. or treating and sort of continue our whole family tradition of 
having that dinner and then going out trick or treating and dressing up in the costume. Yeah. Um, so you carried on the tradition, which is something I I've done as well with my children. Um, they very good, much yes. enjoy sort of partaking in it, and um, we do our best. We we certainly try to make it we you know make it magical and important. Um, for, for me, Halloween today now, uh, as I'm older and, um, the fact that I, I research the paranormal, I'm an investigator, you would think that this time of year would, um, like Sika, you say would, you know, is very busy, very, very meaningful. Um, in terms of my paranormal work, um, surprisingly it's not because all, Although Halloween and, and Samhain, as as it's known in the old the old language, um, I don't think about that during my paranormal work at Halloween time. And I have to admit, what I think of these days mm-hmm. is nothing paranormal at all. It's that it's that Halloween movie that <laughs> oh the movie. Yeah. yeah. Uh, right. when you, yeah. Today you could say to me Halloween, and that's the first thing that comes into my mind is that is that old Halloween movie. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. See, and for me, I mean, I obviously growing up here, my my family come from England and Scotland and Norway, and so um, I grew up with pretty much the traditional North America Halloween, right? costumes and going out and trick-or-treating and I lived in a fairly small community it really was um, a very tiny area in the middle of farm country we had about five streets in a very small neighborhood so you know there was one main laneway that went down to a huge dairy farm at the end and that was the that was the street that we lived on, or the laneway, as we used to call it. It was never paved. It had no street lights. But um, by the time I was sixteen, there was about a hundred houses on it. But it was a good, probably kilometer and a half long. And so going from uh, the the main street, the main road. Um, down to our house, we were about halfway or maybe three quarters of the way down the lane, and we were surrounded by farms. So there was nothing around us. It was just open fields for forever. <laughs> like literally, you could you know ride your horse or your motorbike or your dirt bike or whatever. And there was you know there was the odd farm here and there dotted around, but we didn't have a lot of subdivisions or anything then. So it was just a very small community. Um, most yeah. of the people on the street were immigrants. So we had uh, we had quite a few Scottish, English. Um, I don't really recall any Irish folks on our street, oddly enough, but we had quite a number of Italians, um, Polish, Ukrainian. Um, we even had uh, two families from um, the islands. One was from Jamaica, and the other one was from Trinidad. So we had we had a couple of um, black families on our street, and we had a number of indigenous families on our street too. So it was kind of a really cool little neighborhood to be in. Um, everybody was friends. Everybody knew each other, and that was a bit of a problem as a kid because <laughs> we were always really, really quite naughty as kids um so you know we couldn't really get away with anything because of course everybody on the street knew who we were like every parent every adult i delivered the little local newspaper so my brother and i everyone knew who we were so of course if we were getting up to no good it was just a quick you know phone call to um, you know my mother or my grandparents and and uh yeah we were tattled on so (laughs) but it was a great little neighborhood for going out to trick-or-treat because in that little community, there was maybe a total of 300 families, and everyone celebrated. Like, I think there might have been one or two houses that would shut off their lights and didn't do the candy thing. But it was so great that we would go out with pillowcases, go home, dump them out, and go back out again. And we'd get that much stuff. Like, it was kind of ridiculous. But, um yeah, you know, our costumes were homemade. My mom was a pretty good seamstress at the time, so my brother and I had some pretty great little costumes over the years. Um, 
you know, and but I mean, they were always homemade, but they were pretty, you know, they were pretty good. Like my mom was pretty good at, at doing these things. So, you know, we, we went out as all sorts of things. I don't know. Do you guys remember, like, what was your favorite costume when you were a kid growing up? Was there one that you really sort of remember today that's stuck in your mind or? I dressed um, up as a witch. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, yeah. And, and again, it was just, it, honestly, it was a simple outfit. We had a, uh, when we lived at that particular hotel that I told you about before oh, yes. with the yep. Victorian, uh, we did actually um, host a, a Halloween party right there fun. for all the kids. And it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, and I did dress up as a witch with, the, with the, you know, the broom and the, um, oh, my gosh, it was great. It was so much fun wearing just a black felt. <laughs> and uh, a top but it also it was uh, yeah it was great uh, in what what it, what do you remember dressing up as for me it was just a simple white sheet with the mm-hmm. with the white sheet as, as a everybody goat. did that yeah. everybody but it's fun no judgment no judgment no judgment it was great yeah. But my my yeah. little son, that was his very first costume when he was three. He wanted to be a ghost, and that was it. And it was literally Aww. he wanted to be a ghost. And we didn't go out trick or treating at the time. We just we gave candy out at the door, and that was great for him. He loved doing that. And I Aww. think for him, like we had, I had a lot of fun. I I had some really great costumes. Like I've got some photos still of my brother and I. I think I'm about five, and I'm a witch. And I've got a plastic mask on my face. But the rest of the costume my mom made, it was really cute. And then my brother was a clown, which was totally appropriate for him. Um, and <laughs> and then um, the next costumes I remember were later on, I was older. See, I don't really remember anything in between that. I remember I was about maybe nine or ten. And I went out in my saloon girl slash AKA pioneer attire. But it was, you know, with the big high brimmed hat. And, the, and it was, you know, it was more like oh, Little House so on the Prairie cool. kind of thing. And yeah. my brother was a leprechaun. And then <laughs> in, in, in grade six, I went out as a Jack's potato chip bag. I made my own costume. <laughs> um, um, yeah, totally. I made, it, I made it from craft paper and put it all together and painted it like a Jack's, you know, with the orange and blue stripes, the old Jack's potato chips. And I remember, too, my girlfriend and I at the time, we went out as Siamese twins. And that was hilariously funny because we got this gigantic two pairs of really big pants. And my mom sewed them into one pair with a leg. So our legs went through one leg in the middle. And then we had, and the same with a shirt. Oh so it was so funny <laughs> trying to keep up with, and, I, and we were, I think we were in about grade seven then. And I remember trying to keep up with everyone else. And it was just so funny because, of course, we're trying to, you know, hop along with the, with this this outfit on. But it was great fun. And and it was a really good neighborhood where we were to grow up, and it was a lot of fun. And even my kids, like my oldest son, you know, I think you know he wanted to be a ghost when he was little. And by the time he was six, we did Beetlejuice. He wanted to be Beetlejuice. Um, oh, awesome. So we did Beetlejuice. Actually, I think he was about five then. And then when he was six, I made him this phenomenally adorable bat costume. He wanted to be a bat. And so I made him this really cute bat costume with the, you know, big wings and and everything. And our local mall at the time used to have a Halloween contest and he won first prize for his little bat. And that, so it was really cute. And then, uh, because I've got the three kids, like, honestly, I can't even remember, like, my, my middle son went out as Link once so we got him the wig and the ears and the whole nine yards and he did link from zelda and uh, my youngest one was just totally happy going out as power rangers anything power rangers or spider-man he didn't care and or he went out as an imperial stormtrooper and a couple of other things he always wanted the more elaborate costumes that kid and then (laughs) And then my middle son, too, I remember him also going out as Spongebob. And that was so fun. Like, he was about nine, right? So I made him this Spongebob, um, literally from a car, you know, cardboard boxes and put it all together. And then we painted it. And he, he put his arms through That's and his adorable. face came through and his legs at the bottom, right? We just left the box open. So it was 
but yeah, so he went out as SpongeBob, and and yeah, so they, you know, it was always fun. And um, at that time, of course, we we had a bit of the dilemma of if I'm taking the kids out trick or treating. My my husband at the time was often not home from work yet because it was still early, and and he didn't often get home till seven or eight o'clock at night. Um, so my older mm-hmm. son, he was ten years older than my middle son. He would stay home, so he got in the in the real you know like he loved to stay home and he would dress up as the grim reaper and all these things and instead of having candy at the door he would we would put hay bales and stuff out front and he would literally sit out there frozen as the grim reaper with this big scythe in his hand (laughs) and the candy would be in a bowl beside him and you'd watch how many kids were like you know would, would were terrified to come because they weren't sure if he was like a real person or, you know, just like a Halloween prop. Like just and, a mannequin. Or- yeah. And the little kids were pretty good. And I remember one night it was a little bit later in the evening. It was probably like 730 and most of the little kids were done and the teenagers were coming around. And we never had a problem with that. Like, I don't care who, I don't even care if adults come trick-or-treating, right? It's just like, have fun. But um, he, the, the, this young couple... They were probably 15 or 16 together, and they came up, and, and I was just inside the front door, and my son was out there, and I could see them at the end of the driveway, and the girl's going, go, go, you go first, you go first. And the boy's like, I'm not going, you go, right? So they both decided to come up, and, of course, my son at that point started to stand up. The boy ran and screamed and left his girlfriend. <laughs> oh, Thank you for watching The Ghost Show Online. Join your hosts again next week as they discuss more tales of the supernatural, the paranormal, and all things spectacular. See you soon. See you soon.